There's one aspect of Christianity that Jews, if we're to be honest, must reject, and that Christians, most notably Pope John XXIII, have begun to reject. It's the concept of rejection itself, the idea that Christianity represents God's rejection of the Jewish people, the old Israel. This is known technically as supersession or replacement theology, and it's enshrined in such phrases as the Christian name for the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. The Old Testament means the testament or the covenant that was once in force, but no longer. On this view, God no longer wants us to serve him the Jewish way through the 613 commandments, but a new way, through a new testament. His old chosen people were the physical descendants of Abraham. His new chosen people are the spiritual descendants of Abraham. In other words, not Jews, but Christians. The result of this doctrine, that God had rejected the Jewish people, were devastating. They were chronicled after the Holocaust by the French historian Jules Isaac. And more recently, they've been set out in books like Rosemary Radford Reuter's Faith and Fratricide and James Carroll's Constantine's Sword. The doctrine led to centuries of persecution and to Jews being treated as a pariah people. Reading Jules Isaac's work brought about a profound metanoia, tshuva, change of heart on the part of John XXIII which led to the Second Vatican Council of 1962 to 1965, culminating in the declaration Nostra Aetate, which transformed relations between the Catholic Church and the Jews. I don't want to explore the tragic consequences of this belief here, but rather its untenability in the light of the biblical sources themselves. To our surprise, the key statement occurs in perhaps the darkest passage of the entire Torah, the curses of Buchul Kosai. Here, in the starkest possible terms, are set out the consequences of the choices the people of Israel makes. If they stay faithful to God, they'll be blessed. But if they're faithless, the results will be defeat, devastation, destruction, and despair. The rhetoric is relentless, the warning unmistakable, the vision terrifying. Yet at the very end come these utterly ex unexpected verses. And yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, nor will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will, for their sakes, remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I may be their God. I am the Lord. In other words, the people might be faithless to God, but God will never be faithless to the people. He may punish them, but he won't abandon them. He may judge them harshly, but he won't forget their ancestors who followed him, nor will he break the covenant he made with them. God doesn't break his promises, even if we break ours. The point is fundamental. The Talmud describes a conversation between the Jewish exiles in Babylon and a prophet. Shmuel said, Ten men came and sat down before the prophet. He told them, Return and repent. They answered, if a master sells his slave, or a husband divorces his wife, does he have any further claim on him? Then the Holy One, blessed be he, said to the prophet, Go and say to them, thus says the Lord, Where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or to which of my creditors did I sell you? Because of your sins you were sold. Because of your transgressions your mother was sent away. In other words, the Talmud places in the mouths of the exiles an argument later repeated by Spinoza that the very fact of exile ended the covenant between God and the Jewish people. God had rescued them from Egypt and therefore became in a strong sense their only sovereign, their king. 
But now, having allowed them to suffer exile, he had in effect abandoned them. And they were now under the rule of another king, the ruler of Babylon. It was as if he had sold them to another master, or as if Israel were a wife God had divorced. Having sold or divorced them, God could have no further claim against them. It's precisely this that the verse in Isaiah, where's your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away, or to which of my creditors did I sell you, that is what that verse denies. God hasn't divorced, or sold, or abandoned his people. And that too is the meaning of the c promise at the end of the curses of Bukhu Kosai. Yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, nor will I break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. God may send his people into exile, but they remain his people, and he will bring them back. This too is the meaning of the great prophecy in Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by day, he who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, says the Lord, will Israel ever cease being a nation before me. This is what the Lord says. Only if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below be searched out will I reject the descendants of Israel because of all they have done, declares the Lord. That is a central theme of the Torah and of Tanakh as a whole, the rejection of rejection. God rejects humanity, saving only Noah when he sees the world filled with violence. Yet after the flood, he vows, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though the inclination of every human heart is evil from childhood, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. That is the first rejection of rejection. Then comes the great famous series of sibling rivalries. The covenant passes through Isaac, not Ishmael, through Jacob, not Esau. But God hears Hagar's and Ishmael's tears. Implicitly, he hears Esau's tears also, because he later commands, Lotataev Edomi, don't hate an Edomite, because he is your brother. And finally, God brings it about that Levi, one of the children Jacob curses on his deathbed, saying, Cursed be their anger so fierce and their fury so cruel. Levi, whom Jacob rejects, becomes the father of Israel's spiritual leaders, Moses and Aaron and Miriam. From now on, all Jews, all Israel are chosen. That is the second rejection of rejection. And even when Israel suffer exile, and find themselves in the land of their enemies. They are still the children of God's covenant, which he will not break, because God does not abandon his people. They may be faithless to him, he will not be faithless to them. That is the third rejection of rejection, stated in our parasha, reiterated by Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, axiomatic to our faith in God who keeps his promises. Thus the claim on which replacement or supersession theology is based, that God rejects his people because they rejected him, is unthinkable in terms of Abrahamic monotheism. God keeps his word, even if others break theirs. God does not, will not ever abandon his people our people. The covenant with Abraham, given content at Mount Sinai, renewed at every critical juncture in Israel's history, is still in force, undiminished, unqualified, unbreakable. The Old Testament is not old. God's covenant with the Jewish people is still alive, still strong. Acknowledgement of this fact has finally transformed the relationship between Christians and Jews and helped wipe away many centuries of tears. Shabbat Shalom.